be some other name. What's in a name? Well, let's find out by comparing what's in this name, Vischer, in the original version 1, with what we can find in the new version 3. Here's the name Thomas Jenner, just lightened up a little bit so we can see it more clearly. Der Veer underneath the horse. Here's the Vero Nihil Various of Henry the Eighteenth Earl of Oxford and the Un Partout of Rosalie and the inscription at the top left hand corner. Now let's compare what we can see. There's an ER here in Fisher that occurs in other places in the newer version. Now I'm no handwriting expert, but I think anyone can see just looking at these that the writing is extremely similar. Let's compare now just the R's here with the R of Vischer. Here's an H, and there's only one to compare it to, which is practically identical. There's a C here, and only one to compare it to. Here's the letter I. There are a couple of them here. Let's look at the X. And the double S, the long medial S, there's only one of those. But there are other shapes in the F's and the D's and L's and B's here that are very similar. And you can see the same curve, the same line. And finally, this is perhaps the most convincing of all. The symbols that Vischer has chosen for his own signature and for this special letter that is a combination of T and H and V. Note that in Klaus Jans Vischer, the I and the J are interchangeable. He's combined the I of Vischer into the J of a CJV kind of logo. It's really very clever. But look, someone's done the same thing with this. The T and the H is the symbol for the triple tau, and it combines into a trigraph of a T and an H and a V symbol. Very reminiscent of the early codes in the gravestone and monument and sonnet's dedication in which we see a triple tau associated with an inverted tau cross, always spelling out the name Veer or Veers. So, we've just seen very convincing evidence that suggests that whoever created version 3 is the same person that created version 1, at least as far as this handwriting font is concerned and the symbolism within it all, and of course, the uncanny accuracy of the engraving itself. But that leaves us at the almost inescapable conclusion that Vischer was indeed the publisher and that his shop, his establishment, The Fischer, used the same artist. Whether or not that artist was Vischer himself, we can never really say. And that leads us to conclude that Vischer, who was in high esteem and had a lot to lose, must have come to some arrangement that guaranteed this work would never ever come out, for it is treasonous and he could have been executed for it. And only really those in power themselves, the two Henrys or people behind them with the power to hide it, could possibly give such a guarantee. Presumably Vischer created a second version, a new engraving, so that he could, should all best laid plans of mice and men not come to fruition and it be found, he could at least say, no, 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 this is not me. This is a separate engraving. Look, I've done it before. I've changed this engraving before to just chop off the heads and put a new one on. Why would I go to this trouble to make an entirely new plate? This cannot be me. Ultimately, I think that's the only thing that would make sense. No matter how much they would assure him, no, 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 this will never be found, he would say, look, this is going to cost you a fortune, because I've got to create a new plate, and at the same time, you've got to absolutely guarantee me that this is just not going to come out. But if it does, then I'm safe, because it's a new plate, and I can at least deny plausibly that it was me. So that takes care of the visual aspect of it the historical aspect of it, the opportunity that they all had to be together to accomplish this. But there's more, because whoever planned this wanted to make sure the message got through loud and clear in many ways. Well, what you're about to see is in fact another cryptographic masterpiece 
in the style of John Dee, certainly following John Dee's methodologies, but this is 15 years after Dee has left this earth. Who is around who could possibly do what you're about to see? There's only one person that I can possibly think of, and that's Sir Francis Bacon, who had the expertise, who had the connections, who was part of the whole story behind the scenes, and who was looking after delivering this message because he himself had his own vested interest in the message getting out there. Because this is about unacknowledged sons of the Queen. And, of course, there's much evidence to suggest that he, too, was one of that elite and hidden group. Stay tuned for part five. Truth will out.